In this video, I'm going to talk to you about writing objectives using the framework cognitive, affective, and psychomotor. So starting with cognitive, cognitive is the thinking that happens inside of your head. So we can't always see it as teachers and what we need to do is to make the thinking visible so that we can assess it. And that is why we write objectives so that we are clear with our students of what we want to see from them so that we can tell if they have learned what we have set as the objective for the lesson. In order to help us make sure that we have a variety of cognitive demand in our lessons, there are some taxonomies that we can use as resources. So the first one is WEBS, um, which is called Depth of Knowledge, often abbreviated DOK. And there is Recall and Reproduction. Basic application of skills and concepts. So uh, this can involve transfer, where you learn it in using one circumstance or context and then apply it in a different context or circumstance. Strategic thinking and extended thinking, what could happen because of what you know. Probably the other most common is Bloom's and Bloom's revised taxonomy includes remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. But we really want students spending the most time with create. So this is Bloom's revised and inverted taxonomy. And then relating this to digital learning, you can see here some of the verbs that you could use in your objectives for all of the same categories, but using skills that they would need to use in digital literacy and in collaboration. So our objectives are normally written with an action verb and then an object of what are they designing? What are they constructing? What are they inventing? Out of these attachments here, I want to show you this page by Iowa State University, and they have the information about how to write a cognitive objective. So again, the verb generally refers to an action of the cognitive process, and then the object generally describes the knowledge students are expected to acquire or construct. So using Bloom's revised taxonomy, here are some different verbs that would match each of those levels. And then what's really interesting about this site is they also talk to you about the knowledge dimension. So we have different kinds of knowledge. There's factual knowledge, conceptual knowledge, procedural, and metacognitive. So factual would be just vocabulary, um, dates and names and places. Conceptual is more about theories or categories. So a good way to think about conceptual is a larger understanding. And then procedural is how you do something. So how do you solve an equation? How do you write an essay? Those are procedural. Metacognitive is thinking about thinking. So how do you know that you understand? How do you know that you're not understanding? And then what do you do so that you can understand? And so then this website maps the cognitive dimensions from Bloom's with these four types of knowledge. So that's a really cool resource. Affective is what we feel or believe or value. And so words to think about this domain are receive, the ability to learn from others, respond, ability to participate responsibly and respectfully, being able to adapt to context, value, 
associate personal and collective values with contextual experience and express value judgments. Organize, this is about prioritizing and internalize, so being able to articulate that it is your own value and to be able to express that consistently. Similarly, here is the psychomotor do domain. Imitate, manipulate, perfect, which means the ability to perform actions with expertise on one's own independently. Articulate, ability to adapt psychomotor skills in a non-standard way in different contexts and use tools or instruments if needed and embody ability to perform actions in an automatic, intuitive, or unconscious way appropriate to the context. And not every course is going to have psychomotor educational objectives, but some will, so I want you to be aware of them. A learning objective is much more specific than a goal. So a goal is the general way that you are thinking about what students will learn, what you really want to have them get out of a course. But an objective is something that is very specific. It is something that you can measure, you can assess if they've learned it or not. And because of that, you may hear about the ideal learning objective with three parts. So the three parts are that measurable verb, so it's the action verb we talked about earlier, um, but it needs to be a verb that can be measured. And that's why sometimes the affective doesn't fit with these ideal learning objectives. Um, so I just want you to be aware of these three parts, but they're not necessary that you adopt this strategy. The second part of the ideal learning objective is an important condition under which the performance is to occur. So is this going to occur in groups, in small groups? Is this going to occur on a test, it, which is a timed situation um, done alone? Is this going to be um, orally or written, or can the student choose which mode? So the different conditions are normally the, um, the actual activity that the assessment is going to be in the form of. And then we still want what we talked about before, the knowledge, the actual knowledge that they're going to learn to be in the learning objective. And then finally, the criterion of acceptable performance. So sometimes people say 80% um, student must be able to reduce fractions 80% of the time. However, frequently you will not see the criterion and condition if they're obvious. So if, if you want students to be able to do it 100%, then that's obvious and you don't have to put that. But sometimes you don't need them to be able to do it perfectly. They don't have to be able to do it every time. They just need to show an understanding. And this is especially true when you are just introducing a standard. So sometimes um, we will introduce a standard at the beginning of the year. We will cycle back around and go a little deeper and try to get to the proficient level the second time. So the first time, you may just want them to be able to do it 80% of the time, but then the second time you reach that standard, you want them to really be able to do it the whole time. And so if you need the criterion and the condition, um, that is one way to write a measurable objective. So if you hear of a behavioral objective or a measurable objective, this is what they're looking for. The purpose of writing objectives is for you as the instructor to know where you're intending to go so you can increase the chance that you and the learner end up there. So if you have to articulate it, then you have to clarify it in your own head and then you're able to also communicate it to others, to the students. It guides the teacher relative to the planning of instruction, delivery of instruction and evaluation of student achievement. So there's only so much time in the day and sometimes we 
get caught up in activity. So um, it's Thanksgiving and we want students to glue feathers on turkeys. And while that is fun, it may not meet a learning objective. And so we just want to be clear about what our learning objectives are and that we're meeting those. And then if we want to also have activities that are about joy or about working together or expressing creativity, then we can have those too. We just need to be clear about what is what. It guides the learner, so it helps the learner to focus and set priorities. Uh, research shows that when teachers are clear about the objectives, it really does impact student outcomes. And it allows for analysis in terms of the levels of teaching and learning. So it allows not only you to self-analyze uh, your own teaching, it also allows you to analyze what the students have learned and it allows other people so you can share your practice and say, you know, where do you think I can improve? And if you can share your objectives and assessments, then you can get that feedback. So I also believe in creating institutional knowledge. That means knowledge not just for your classroom, not within the four walls of your classroom, but knowledge that can be passed down, um, shared to perhaps the teacher that may teach that course in the future or even to your own self so that next year when you're going to teach this you can look to see okay what went well what didn't what should i keep what should i change um, so many of you have told me that you came into the position not having anything and so writing down these objectives in your lesson plans making using backwards design to then say okay well what is the evidence of these learning objectives going to be and writing that into um, the learning targets can make it very clear for others when they may have the opportunity to use your curriculum in the future.